You are listening to the F11 Photography Podcast. of light to the purveyors of pictures to all of you listening from around the world this is the f11 photography podcast i am your host kevin deal And this is going to be an audio-only podcast about Canon gear today, which means Brandon Gorey is absent because he's a Nikon user and he doesn't care about Canon cameras. And I totally don't blame him because if he did an entire episode on Nikon, I'd probably sit there and be bored. Although we did do a Nikon Z8 episode and I found stuff to talk about because I'm the gearhead of this show. But uh, yes, I'm going to do an episode today on the Canon R5. I'm also testing out my new toy because I like toys. I got the Focusrite Vocaster 2. So for the first year and change of this pod, we use the Rode, I guess they call it the Rodecaster, the original one, and it served us well. It did a pretty good job And it had an insane amount of features. In fact, it had way more features than we ever used. And our room that we broadcast out of is a glorified closet. It's pretty small, which has its advantages in terms of reflectivity because it's really easy to tame the sound in that room. Uh, But it's also very crammed in there. And space is a premium. And our desk is not large. And we felt that the roadcaster just took up too much space. So I retired it. I sent it off. I sent it off to the boneyard and it's now gone. And really the only thing that this thing doesn't have that we can implement in later is it doesn't have a third microphone preamplifier. Uh, we of course have guests in studio from time to time. So I'm going to have to figure out a solution from that for that. And I will, but we have retired it. And now I'm using this really cool new unit from Focusrite. And I have to say, I'm very impressed with the audio quality that it puts out, the fidelity, the way it processes uh, speech. I think it sounds better than the Rode. I know they did come out with a new Rode and it's like $700. And this was like 150 on Amazon. And if you don't know the history of Focusrite, Focusrite is a very prestigious company from the United Kingdom. Uh, they have a good pedigree of microphone preamplifiers and uh, analog to digital converters and all the things uh, that when you buy them uh, in high quality help the fidelity of audio. And they went all in on this unit and uh, this design. And I, I like the way it sounds. So moving forward, uh, hopefully you like the way my voice sounds on here and uh props to focus right and now a word from our sponsor today's episode is sponsored by gamut are you looking for world-class cinematic video LUTs check out gamut whether you're shooting on sony canon panasonic nikon dji or black magic their conversion LUTs bring all your footage to the same starting place That's right, if you're shooting a wedding and one of your cameras is Canon and the other is Nikon, the footage will all end up looking the same. And don't worry, Fuji users, help is on the way. I've actually been in contact with Gamut and they're telling me that they are working on LUTs for Fuji. They also make creative LUTs that are catered toward weddings, commercials, editorials, and YouTube projects. Gamut now also offers movie barcode generators. Want to create your own movie barcode? Well, now you can by using their entirely free movie code barcode generator. Use that generator to build out palettes and barcodes for your films. Go to gamut.io to check out their insanely generous holiday offerings, and I'll leave a link in the description of this pod.
Hi, I'm Jordan Groby, and you're listening to the F-11 Photography Podcast. All right, I am back with this audio-only version of the pod. If you happen to discover us on YouTube and you're looking at this uh this episode and you're like, where are the visuals at? Uh, sometimes we do audio only pods when I'm at the house and I have something on my mind, which is what I'm doing today. But when we do our video pods, it's me and Brandon sitting in our studio and we have the, the video camera up and we show you a lot of visual references. And so uh, if you did stumble upon this podcast and you like it, uh, please click the subscribe button below. We sure would appreciate it. And obviously, if you're listening to us on Apple and Spotify, our longtime listeners, thank you for coming back. So today's episode, we're going to talk about the Canon R5. Uh, you know, a little bit of appreciation to the original, and we're going to talk about the possibility of a new one coming out. So, uh, the R5 was introduced in the middle of 2020, and I have to say that even in 2024, there are so many features on this camera that are relevant and useful and still on the cutting edge. It's a testament to how great the original R5 was. Uh, at the time, it had a you know it was it was kind of a one of a kind camera. There weren't a lot of cameras out there that had the same specifications. So you have a 45 megapixel CMOS sensor. Now there's a lot of cameras out there that are over 40 megapixels, uh, but at the time there really weren't that many. You know, Fuji had like their GFX 50s, and and there, you know I think Sony may have had one that was over that. But there really weren't a lot of cameras at the time that were high megapixel mirrorless cameras, and. So that 45 megapixel CMOS sensor uh, really changed the game for uh, full frame cameras. Uh, the Digic X processor, uh, the 12 frames per second, which unless you're shooting like crazy fast sports or crazy fast birds flying by, I think 12 frames per second mechanical shutter is perfectly fine. Uh, at the time, the dual pixel CMOS AF2 uh, to me is a cheat code. It still is a cheat code. Now, there are better cheat codes out there uh, the R3, even my R8 and my R50 in terms of tracking, I think have better algorithms. I don't think that the R50 is as uh, good of a hit rate, but I will say that my R8 is pretty damn close to my R5. And so the autofocus on the cheaper cameras is catching up to a much more expensive camera like the R5, which of course, when it came out was almost $4,000. And of course, when you do factor in taxes, it was over $4,000. And so um, I guess in that sense, Canon could maybe improve a little bit now. I will give Canon props that they did do a massive firmware upgrade for the R5 about a year ago. They put it closer to being on par to my R7 and my R8 because of the subject tracking and all that, which was lacking in the original release of the camera. For stills, I still think to this day that the R5 is just as good as almost any camera out there in most areas. Uh, another thing that Canon does that I love, and I'm so glad that they trickle this down to like the R7, is it has that really cool curtain that goes down over the sensor when you turn the camera off. When you turn the camera on, the curtain goes up. So I've never actually cleaned the sensor on my R5 in the three and a half years that I've owned it. I, I haven't had to. Uh, I just turn it off. The window goes down. The curtain goes down and then I take the lens off and it's protected. And I put the lens on, I, I turn the camera on and then it's exposed. And so this camera, the only time this camera has ever like seen the light of day, the sensor is in that brief second when of course the shutter opens, which it's protected by glass. And then on my YouTube channel, when I'm making comparisons between Canon cameras and Fuji cameras and other cameras, I will demonstrate turning the camera on and off without a lens just to show how that curtain goes down, up and down, over the sensor. Beyond that, my R5 has never been exposed. Like I take it to white sands, I can change a lens without anything getting into it. So there's there's some really revolutionary uh, technology in the R5 that is still relevant in 2024 because Nikon, I think the Z8 and the Z9 have that feature that I just spoke about. Uh, Fuji doesn't have anything, including their their uh, GFX line, which is just boneheaded because you have a sensor that's 60% larger than full frame, my GFX 100S, this gigantic sensor that has exposed the elements. And there's no way to like 
you know, change it to where you're not vulnerable. Even if you take the camera and point it down, if wind blows upward, like at white sands or on a beach, you're screwed. And so I think the other manufacturers could definitely take a page from Canon's uh, notebook. Love the ergonomics. I, I think that the original R5, which I'm holding in my hand right now, is the benchmark for what a camera should feel like when you hold it in your hand. And I would love for other manufacturers to, to take from the playbook. Um, and no, I'm not just here kissing ass. I'm going to get into the cons here in a minute, but I, I do want to talk about why this is such a revolutionary camera. And frankly, if you're listening to this and you're on the fence about getting an R5, and you don't have an insane budget, uh, very soon, it may very well be time for you to get your R5 and you may be able to get it on the cheap because there are rumors that an R5 Mark II is on the horizon uh, in time for the Olympics. Now, I, I take that with a grain of salt uh, that it's going to be ready for the Olympics, the R5. I think the R1 will be ready for the Olympics because that's an Olympic camera. Uh, I don't really understand what having an R5 is going to do uh, in time for the Olympics because that's not really what the R5 is for. Yes, you can shoot sports on it. Yes, you can shoot stuff like wildlife on it, but it's a high megapixel camera. It's kind of a a compromise in terms of some speed, like it doesn't shoot as fast as an R3, but that is at the benefit that you have much larger files to work with. I think I look at that as a good thing, but going back to the rumors, I don't see the R5 necessarily coming out in time for the Olympics, or I should say because of the Olympics. It may come out before the Olympics and they may just announce it and the R1 at the same time because they just happen to have them ready, but I don't really see what the connection of the R5 being uh, released around the Olympics has to do with anything. I think they're going to release it when it's ready. And they may very well be taking their time because Sony just came out with a global shutter on one of their cameras. And uh, Nikon just came out with a Z8, which I think has some features, especially some video features that I have not seen in anything other than the R5C for Canon. And so I, I personally welcome that kind of stuff. I love it when uh, feet is being held to the fire, so to speak. And I, I love the fact that Nikon and Sony are coming out with these revolutionary features because that means that Canon has to react. And frankly, if we're just talking about stills, I haven't shifted to video yet. Don't worry, a lot of you video people have, have an ax to grind on the R5 and we'll get there. But in terms of stills, you know, to get somebody to buy a new R5 for stills, it's gonna have to have some pretty crazy features uh, that are going to get them to kind of get pushed over the edge. Now, when we talk about what those features may be, um, these are rumors, by the way. And Canon rumors, by the way, uh, I'm not plugging Canon rumors. As a matter of fact, I think Canon rumors is not my favorite thing in the world because they will just print anything to get clicks. Um, I remember in 2022, remember it's 2024 as I record this, in 2022, the uh, RF... 35 millimeter 1.2 L lens was going to come out. If you don't believe me, go back to Canon Rumors and check it out. They don't delete their old posts. Uh, of course, it's now uh, almost March of 2024, and there's still no RF 35 millimeter 1.2. So that just goes to show that something that has the name Rumors in it probably isn't something to take totally seriously. Uh, do take things with a grain of salt. We'll briefly talk about the 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 rumors of the specifications, but uh, none of that really matters. So yeah, they're talking about maybe a sixty two mega uh, sixty two megapixel stacked CMOS sensor. Yeah, okay. Uh, variable resolution, 62, 31, 15.5 megapixels. I don't know about that, man. Um, you know, maybe I, you just shoot in CRAW if you want smaller files, right? Um, and and so there's just there's these rumors that they're that they're spitting out and. You know, let's just talk about what I want to see in the camera, okay? But first, before we get to that, let's talk about the things on the video side. <laughs> and, and there's quite quite a bit to talk about of the original R5 uh, that, that left us wanting more. Now, I will say that the announced specifications for the R5 were actually fantastic. 8K raw, 30 frames per second, 4K, 120 frames per second. There are some really awesome specs, video specs in the R5. It's not the specs that were the acts that people had to grind. It was the execution that people had the acts to grind with. Record time limits. You can't have a $4,000 camera with record time limits, or at the very least, you got to up those record time limits because the record time limits on the R5 are a joke. 
the overheating. To me, the overheating of the original R5 was rushed to market. That, that, that to me says that it was rushed to market because if they knew that overheating was going to be a problem, why didn't they attack it the way that Fuji attacked the X-H2S and the X-H2 by putting a fan in it? Or Canon themselves decided to release the R5C, which has a fan in it. And so unless Canon is just saying, hey, the R5 exists to take really short uh, videos at high resolution. That's that's what we're marketing it toward. Uh, and I, I never saw any materials marketing it that way. Like, nope, it's a professional camera. It does professional video. Well, I think that the video people have a very legitimate gripe when they when they say that, hey, this camera, like, it doesn't it it do, it, it doesn't meet the specs. And you know, there's nothing like video. Nothing moves faster than video. Your video specs in two or three months are going to be out of date. And so if you don't even execute your video specs right, you've got a serious problem. And I think Canon uh, has that with the R5, and that's why they made an R5C. And I think that and the fact that they've released an R6 Mark II, and when you see what Nikon and Sony have come out with lately, it's really forcing Canon into having to release a new version of the R5 to please some of their users. I think, like I said, overall, stills users are going to be totally fine with the R5 in its current form, but they'll welcome new features of a new R5. I know I certainly will, but I really do think that the massive overhaul that needs to be done on a new version of the R5 is going to need to be video-based. And so I want them to do that. And, you know, keep everything, keep a lot of the other things the same. The R5 is a tank. I actually had it in my backpack. It fell out of my backpack onto my driveway with an RF 85 millimeter 1.2 attached to it. It went slam. I yelled, oh shit, to where people probably like seven houses down heard me say it. I picked up the camera. It worked just fine. My focal plane was fine on the RF 85. Just a testament to how strong Canon cameras are. Please do not deviate away from that. Uh, there are some camera companies that cut corners. Please do not cut those corners. That is something that we want. Obviously, the IBIS was welcome. Uh, I think that the IBIS on the R5 is fantastic. Uh, so let's talk about what we think we want to see, what I want to see, on a new version of the R5. So you know, I want to see improved dynamic range. I know people talk about higher megapixels, and a lot of times you need higher pex higher megapixels to get higher dynamic range. They 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 run hand in hand. So you're probably going to see a higher megapixel camera coming out. Uh, you know, 62, 75 megapixels somewhere in there, and I'll welcome that if that comes with uh, improved dynamic range because no cameras see as well as our eyes, and I want all cameras to see as well as our eyes because when I look at, uh, uh, you know, shadows and I look at highlights, I want to compress all that stuff closer to each other. And I, you know, if I want to try to pull shadows out or tame, tame those highlights, uh, I want a camera that can do that kind of close to what my eyes can see. I should be able to see a blue sky at 2 PM and I should be able to pull stuff out of shadows at 2 PM on a lot of cameras and including my R5. It does an okay job at that, but it doesn't do, do an amazing job of that. And I would like to see them improve the dynamic range. So definitely a fan of that, uh, idea. And I hope Canon decides to implement it. Uh, you know, it'd be cool for the video people obviously to see, uh, long, recording times with no limits you, you know the limit of course is your battery or your card that would be the ideal thing to see is hey there is no recording limit on it really uh you're 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 limited by your record time that would be great you know maybe 8k 60 frames per second recording internally uh i think that would be amazing with no overheating good luck with that of course uh, i i've seen stuff with the nikon z8 having some overheating issues with certain cards uh speaking of cards you know, when you look at the uh, the R5, you have the dual card slots like you do on all, uh, you know, professional Canon cameras. But one is a CF Express Type B, and then the other one is an SD card. And I, I would love to see them get to using two CF Express Type B cards, uh, but that, that remains to be seen because CF Express Type B cards can get pretty darn hot. And I'm not a I'm not an expert on camera bodies and manufacturing cameras, but if you're having overheating issues with uh, the combination of a CF Express and an SD card, 
uh, and, and you know, with the specifications that Canon had four years ago, I would imagine that if you decided to have two CF Express Type B cards in there, and you demand things like 8K recording up to 60 frames per second internally, recording at 120 frames per second internally. I think if you have all that in a new camera body, I, I think you're going to run into new overheating issues. Now, uh, maybe they have a, an attachment, like a fan attachment, like they they, they have with the uh, Fuji X-H2 and some other cameras out there. I think that that's pretty much going to have to happen. I'm, I'm very skeptical that you're going to get everything you want. Like, I've never seen a camera release where it, like, checked every, like, wish list box of mine. And, you know, I think that somewhere Canon is going to have to make a compromise on a new R5 when it comes out. And maybe they're going to, you know, keep an SD card as the second card because all these uh, things that people are asking for are going to make the camera operate even hotter. And so I don't know if it's physically possible uh, to do all that. Now, if they do pull that off and there's no issues with overheating and you have dual uh, CF Express Type B cards and you have all these crazy video features, I mean, wow, that's going to definitely be a game changer camera. And, you know, maybe Canon needs to tap the brakes and only release an R5 Mark II until it is a game changer camera because you know, getting somebody like me to get a new R5 Mark II, it's going to take something like uh, noticeably improved dynamic range and, and maybe those video features to get me to just like go out of my way really quickly to pull the trigger on it. Um, the, the, there are people out there saying, hey, we want to see improved uh, EVF on it. I, I Maybe I'm in the minority here, but like whenever I hear people complain about like the EVF of a, of a, of a camera, I, like, I've never actually like been like, oh my gosh, I am being prevented from taking this picture because the EVF is so bad. Like I haven't seen a camera really since 2017 uh, where I've noticed that the EVF was a problem. And so, uh, you know, to me, if it improved battery life to not make the EVF better, I would be in favor of a, a lesser EVF. Uh, that's just me. But uh, I know that there are a lot of you out there who completely disagree with me. So I guess for those people, make a better EVF. But if they don't make a better EVF, if you're going to choose a place to compromise the camera, that's where I say compromise the camera because my standards for an EVF are, can I see what I'm trying to compose and frame up? Yes, I can. Am I ready to take the picture? Yes, I am. I press the shutter release. I move on with my life. That, that to me is the extent of how much I care about an EVF. But there are a lot of people out there who, who disagree with me. So, uh, you know, hey, great. Uh, if they put an improved EVF in there, great. I can take it or I can leave it. Um, there are rumors that uh, multifunction hot shoe. I mean, I think every camera that uh, Canon comes out with now has the multifunction hot shoe. I don't think that's a rumor as much as it's a very much an expectation because you're starting to see it. But you know that that I'm starting to see some weird implementation with that that hot shoe, that advanced hot shoe, because on my R50, I can't use my Godox or my Pro Photo triggers on my R50. I have to actually go out and buy a $39.99 accessory in order to make that camera be able to use flash, unless I go out and buy the proprietary Canon flash. And I'm just gonna say straight up, that is bullshit because you know the uh the beginner who's going to be going out and buying an r50 like like they really need to buy an extra accessory like the whole reason why they're buying an r50 and not an r8 is because they don't have the money for an r8 so the fact that you're taxing them 39.99 for the right to use an adapter is complete and utter bullshit and I hope they don't do that on the new R5 Mark II if it comes out. I mean, they didn't do it on the original R5. They didn't do it on my R8. I'm not expecting them to do it on an R5 Mark II, but if they do, that'll be messed up. And I mean, I'm, I'm kind of mixed on that new uh, multi-function hot shoe because I did a review on their microphone, the DME1D, and I have to be completely honest with you. I am an audio engineer. I have years of experience. I've used Rode camera mics. I've used Godox camera mics. I've used Shure camera mics. I've used Sennheiser sh uh, camera mics. I've used all sorts of different company camera mics, DJI, many different qualities. And none was a bigger steamy pile of dog shit than the Canon DM-E1D, which I can't remember if it was like a three or a $400 microphone. But to pay three or $400 for an on-camera microphone that sounds like complete and utter garbage is totally messed up that Canon did that. Like they, they, like how could you not spend money making a microphone that sounded good when you're paying a premium for it? You know, I mean, it's, it's a really expensive microphone and I did a review of it. Uh, you can go check it out. Just be prepared to have your ears be offended because that microphone sounds like a steamy pile of dog shit. And, 
uh, you know, th- th- there, there are cool things about the microphone. The thing that appealed to me that got me to buy it in the first place was the fact that it has a button on top of it. And so uh, if you want to quickly pull up your audio settings on your on your camera, you just push the button on the microphone and your settings come up. That is pretty awesome. Unfortunately, that's the only good thing about it. Uh, it also runs off your camera battery, so you don't have to put double A's in there. I don't think that's that big of a deal. But uh, another cool thing about it, that was it. I mean, those are the two cool things about it. Uh, other than that, yeah, don't recommend it. So as of right now, the multifunction hot shoe, like there's just not a lot of good accessories for it. I think Tascam makes one, but uh, Canon really needs to bolster that up. They put the future proofing in there and that's fine, but you now have to build the products. And I hope that when they roll out the R5, they start rolling out some products that don't suck. And uh, yeah, so that's 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 something that I, uh, I, 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 I guess we've read about that's gonna come out for it is they're gonna give it the multifunction hot shoe, which great. Um, I don't want them to really touch the button layout. I love the button layout of my R5. There are rumors that they are going to mess with it a little bit. Uh, if they do mess with it, I, I I know I'm in the minority on this, but on my R7, there's a tiny little uh, thumb dial with a button in the middle that's up closer to where your index and middle fingers are. So it's closer to where I like to have my exposure triangle programmed. And so to me, I actually prefer that location over what all you, um, you know, 5D R5 owners like, which is the gigantic wheel that's lower down on the back of the body. Uh, I personally couldn't care less about that location. I actually like it up higher because my thumb is already up there and I'm, I'm uh, messing with my servo and my eye detect when I'm up on my R5. And so just being able to move my thumb slightly to the left of the scroll wheel, scroll wheel rather than moving it down the back of the body to find the scroll wheel to me makes sense. But I'm clearly in the minority on this because the R7 is the only camera that's ever had it. They didn't put it on the R8. They didn't put it on the R50. They didn't put it on the R100, the R10, all these other cameras. None of them have it. So I guess it's going to be like that multi-touch bar on the uh, original EOS R, which was terrible. And I guess everyone else decided that that also was terrible, despite the fact that I disagree with them. Uh, but if they do uh, have a new button layout, they have some large shoes to fill because the button layout on the original R5 is absolutely fantastic. I think it's the gold standard. I think the ergonomics are the gold standard. So I'm very much of the opinion that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, something I would like to see them improve upon with a new R5 Mark II is when you turn the camera on, if you want to switch from stills to video mode, you have to push the mode button down and then go into uh, you know stills or video mode. Well, that's not a huge pain in the ass. I actually prefer the way that their newer cameras are doing it, where there's just a switch on the camera that takes you from stills uh, over to video mode. And then another thing that's kind of odd about the R5, and maybe there's a way around this, and if there is, you can tell me about it in the comments, but basically if you're in stills mode and you're shooting and you decide, man, I need to go quickly to video and you just hit the record button, uh, when you hit record, the settings that it uses are whatever settings that you have in custom to video shooting mode. That's kind of weird. And I actually didn't know how to access that. I had to go look it up on Google. And I finally figured out that, oh, I can adjust this in custom shooting mode too. I would like to see Canon think of maybe a better way to go about that. I'm not necessarily giving them a solution here. I'm just saying make it better. I'm not paid for a living to make these things better. That's what Canon's paid to do. And so I can bitch because I have a podcast and I have a microphone in front of my mouth so I can say whatever I want, right? Right. Uh, Now, going to the last thing that I hope to see Canon do, and I hope all manufacturers do this, is put tracking in your cameras. If someone's going to spend $4,000, and by the way, I do anticipate an R5 Mark II to be above $4,000 because of inflation. The other one used to be, the old one used to be $3,800. So it... It's probably going to be at least $39.99 for the new one, and I could see it go as high as $4,500, so keep that in mind. And so um, I would like to see them put tracking inside of it. And for those of you who are all like, oh, man, that sounds like a big pain in the ass. How would that be implemented? Well, I'll tell you how it be implemented. I have AirPods, and I lost my AirPods in Space Mountain, and I, uh, I used to find my phone. I, I emailed to the lost and found of Disney World that, hey, my AirPods are inside Space Mountain, which is pitch dark, but here's where they are. Two weeks later, they got mailed to me and I have them now. I'm literally wearing them right now to monitor this pod that I'm recording from home. So those are $100 devices. When you go spend $4,000 on a camera, I don't think it's unreasonable for uh, us to be able to find our cameras. Now, 
that comes with a caveat that there needs to be a registration process. And that's okay. You can make a registration process because you, you go out, you buy an R3, you go out and buy an R5, R5 Mark II, whatever. You register your camera online. And when you register your camera, they can say, hey, would you like to opt in for tracking services? And you could say yes. And when you do that, you could have something maybe in your hot shoe that uses a separate battery that only like seasoned photographers know how to get to. Like you have to have a, a manual, an operation manual in there because chances are the person who steals your camera isn't going to know what it is. They're just going to try to go pawn it off or whatever. And they're not going to know that it has a separate tracking device in it because if you take out that LPE 6M battery, uh, the camera is off at that point. But if you have a separate battery in there that can track its movements, that would be amazing. And I think that the, I think we're on the cusp of being able to do that. It's just a matter of camera manufacturers uh, going out and doing it. And of course, if you sell your camera, you can transfer registration to the new owner. They, you know, There is a little bit of a complicated process behind it, but to be quite honest, for a $4,000 camera, I am totally willing to jump through that hoop. And of course, it, it can be an opt-in, opt-out service. So if you are one of those people who... Um, who is a conspiracy theorist and thinks that the government's tracking your movements and all that, and you don't want your location services on, by all means, opt out of it. But for me, I'm going to opt in, and I certainly hope they put that in the next version of this camera. That does it for today's episode. I thank each and every one of you for listening. Go check us out at f11pod.com. Our social media handles are at f11pod. We appreciate each and every one of you who tune into this podcast. We are growing thanks to you. If you catch us on YouTube, we do highly encourage you to click the subscribe button below. And if you are listening on Apple or Spotify, thank you. And go subscribe to us on YouTube as well because that helps us grow. And when we grow, we get to make more podcasts for all of you. And until next time, chase light and not algorithms. Thank you for listening to today's episode. For more information about this podcast, go to www.f11pod.com.